this what conference will now be recorded. It's like we are going to cover African American history in the span of one hour and 30 minutes related to astrology. What I'm doing, oh, gotta wait for side. This takes us, yeah. My aspiration is that, you know, it's more complex and diverse than what has happened to African people in the United States, even in the US. The history of African people is very complex. My hope here is to look at various astrological charts of key people and events in the history of Africans in the Americas, including Haiti, Brazil, the US, for example, to build a vocabulary for articulating this destiny. So that's my goal. My key goal is to start looking at these charts, examining some of the ideas to see if we can find a pattern by which we can articulate what might be a quote unquote destiny. I will use summary points as a way station highlight to highlight key things from each area explored. So there'll, there'll be a point where I think, okay, here's what we can take away or draw from. One key thing to know is that I'm trying to keep the balance between those of you who are well tutored in astrology and those of you who are not as well tutored, so that we can, you know, move along. But do keep in mind that I am going to talk a lot about charts. So, um, you know, for those particular moments, I'll kind of just like not speed through them, but do them well enough, then get to some other stuff that we can break down. So let's define destiny first, because that's a really weird word, right? I mean, like, destiny can mean a lot of things. I always say that fate has two arms, and one of them is your own, right? So, you know, it's just like literally, we like to think, especially if we're more of the modern mindset, that we control all aspects of our fate and quote unquote destiny. Um, Scientists will tell you, also in terms of other people, that that's not likely true, but that doesn't mean you don't have any control. So I would say that astrology is a gift of how we learn to work that one arm that we do control, right? So destiny, I would see as the moment when you work your life chances and possibilities with that arm. You forge your destiny. You create your destiny from the rudiments of fate, right? So you take the fate and you make it. Um, so fate as the conditions of, for creation, while destiny as the act of creation. Though you certainly describe it as a moment of discovery as well. Some people are like, well, I discovered my destiny. And I'm not knocking that. I, I tend to think more in terms of even like the Nietzschean idea of you creating it. But if you want to say like, well, I discovered it, it was embedded in me, it's like karma, I'm going to see, that's fine as well. So let's get right to it, the new world, the Americas. The African presence in the Americas. Now, I want to present three different ideas that I think do work in tandem, but they're important. It's believed that Africans have had a presence in the Americas before Columbus, and that's very important to understand for multiple reasons, because you're like, oh, well, you know, uh, before Columbus, Africans just were in Africa. Um, it's believed that Abu Bakr, also called Abu Bakari, um, is believed to have advocated his kingdom in the kingdom of Mali to sail to explore the limits of the ocean in the 14th century. His successor, just to put this in context for you, is believed to be Mansa Musa. So Mansa Musa was the richest man, as far as we know, in human history. Just think about that for a second, like not Jeff Bezos. Mm -hmm. Let me give you a context, because you're like, well, how? I mean, like, for one, he had he had lots of gold, and he was a Muslim. So many people don't know that West Africa, and this where Mali is, um, long all over a long period of time had been under the, the rubric of Islam. So he decided to make a Hajj. On this pilgrimage to making the Hajj from Africa and up toward Saudi Arabia. He had so much money that he actually blossomed the whole economies in terms of spending his money. So this is his, his predecessor, is Abu Dhabi, who disappeared and went off into, um, we believe, to the Americas. Now, I will be, the historian in me will say this. We have actual full historical record that Abu Dhabi did this and that we have documentation for this. No, when I say we don't have documentation, meaning on this side of the Atlantic, but some scholars believe that they have found the rudiments of the testimony to an African presence in the Americas. 
along with the idea of the Olmec heads in Mexico, and you can Google that, I don't have any pictures here because I'm going to get distracted. Um, they have the phenotypical features of Africans. And if you look at it, if you actually look at those those images, it will look like, you know, it will look like Popsi, you know, you know, like Raheem, you know, from around the way. So these are these are people. Now, are they, I mean, are they actually Native Americans who look African? That goes to my last point. Is that there are many people who believe, because race is a very slippery thing anyway, conceptual, isn't it? Right? We, we go through this all the time, like, is this person black or, you know, what's this or qualification of this? Um, but one could argue because, you know, life has started from Africa and we don't know when people crossed over into what we now call the Americas, that these people could have been early Africans who were here and, you know, now we call them indigenous. So I just wanted to make that clear that, you know, it wasn't just about enslaved Africans coming into the Americas as much as that. There's also the possibility of a presence here before that. Now, this particular chart, can you zoom in just a little bit? I didn't go over. Well, thank you. Can everyone see that chart pretty much? This is the chart I'm going to probably talk about the most. And I'm going to give you another version of this chart, but this is the chart that I really wanted to get into. It is the first Africans chart, as I call it, and I'm setting it for August 30th, 30th 1619, 10 a.m., Hampton, Virginia. What is this chart? This chart is the chart or the believed idea, and it's rectified. Um, one thing you'll see is that it's rectified by Mark Enfield. Um, I also came to a similar thing. Uh, a similar time frame independent of Mark's work. Mark is also an astrologer, maybe you've heard of him. Um, and it's also in, uh, if you zoom out just a second, it's in a book that was edited by Noel Teal called Astrology Looks at History, if you want to look that up. But just to zoom back in, thank you. Um, wait. The thing is about this particular chart, we do not know the actual date nor the time when these indentured Africans first arrived in what some believe was Jamestown, but it was actually Hampton, Virginia. So let me explain that because um, the governor of Virginia recently got in trouble. People believe that he was misquoting because he was on, a, I think, when, um, I'm getting on Robin's last name, a Good Morning America, and she was talking to him. Huh? Oh, Robin. Robin Roberts. Robin Roberts. <laughs> and she, she was correcting him. He said the first indigenous servants to arrive in Hampton, Virginia. And she said, you mean slaves, right? Here's the thing. Robin was wrong. Okay. And why Robin was wrong, and he was actually correct, is that America didn't start off as a slave nation. That's very important. The idea is that people were brought over into the People are quick to remind you, especially on Facebook. There were Irish people, there were white people who came here too, right? And that's true. They came here as indentured servants, where you had a time of servitude, and then you had your freedom. Where you learned a skill, learned a trade, and you were indentured to a particular person and learned that. These particular Africans actually um, were captured from off uh, a pirate ship, transferred to a slave ship. And then technically, by virtue of the fact that now they were in this other place or the country, um, no one knew what to do with them. So there were 20 or so Africans on this particular vessel called the White Lion, and they didn't have a fair status. So they were taken on as indentured servants. And then their descendants and other people who came for the development of the slave trade, they were made into slaves. That's the distinction. So, the earliest documentation that we have for the arrival of people who would become slaves in this nation as Africans is perhaps this chart. And I just want to point out a few things to you that we're really going to look at. And I know you can't really see that red marker as well. Because I want you to pay attention to this Venus in Leo at 11 degrees. The sun is 6 degrees. This Mercury, that's 23 degrees and 1 minute. Saturn is at 21. 21 Gemini in 20 minutes. Uranus is at 26. There will not be a place, so don't worry, we'll have to remember all the 
And then it is a Scorpio rising chart. And then the Mars here is at 14 degrees. And then we have the moon of Scorpio, and we have the moon and Pluto in Taurus, um, one at 14, the moon, and then 12 for Pluto. Um, one other particular point is that I want to point out the north node at 12 degrees of Capricorn. Don't worry, I'm going to go over these points a few more times. But this chart really <laughs> speaks to me, and I think speaks at the heart of some of the conditions. So one thing I'm going to mention is Columbus in America. October 12th, um, 14, it's at, yeah, it is 92. I have 6.30 a.m., and I'll explain the time in just a second, because it's not arbitrary. It is believed to be a time. This is from, yeah, yeah, that, that's helpful. Um, and it's from Samano Bay, Samano Bay, Bahamas. This is from Nicholas, Nicholas Campion's book, World Wars Folks. And that particular time comes from where he says, according to Columbus's diary, that he docked and came off the boat at dawn, which would be to be about 6.30. And you can see the sun is coming above the horizon. And I want you to note, Pluto is in Scorpio, a conjoined to the north node exactly. That's one of the salient points of this chart. Um, the moon is opposite to the Uranus here, and you will notice that this Uranus is opposite to what I call the first African's chart. Now, what does this mean? One thing to understand about the development of enslavement, and Columbus is actually somewhat instrumental in this, is what was happening at that particular time in 1492. 1492, the Moors and the Jews were thrown out of Spain and Portugal. And what began to develop in Europe after the Crusades was a taste for sugar, a taste for spices. And I'm gonna go more into that, but Columbus actually was very excited by the idea of finding spices. Everyone wants to talk about Columbus and gold, right? And a new route to India, but why did he want to go to India for spices, right? This becomes critical, and you'll see, especially with the idea of Pluto and what I'm going to unpack about Pluto and the North Node, you'll come to see a little more about that. Then the other place I want to talk about briefly is the discovery of Brazil. Again, we see in, can you zoom in again? I want you to notice this again is also an accurate time from Nicholas, Cam Nicholas Campion's book. This is for um, April 22nd, 1550, 634, no, 534 p.m. Bahia, Brazil. Okay. Now, why is that significant? Bahia, if you have been to Brazil or you plan on going to Brazil, has the most densely populated number of Africans outside of Africa. Okay. So many people don't know that, you know, especially we African Americans, because we sometimes think about our privilege in America. It's like, yo, we, like, we have the biggest population in the world. We do not. It's in Brazil. Mm -hmm. And this is the setup. Um, the reason why the Portuguese were there in Brazil was for the development for trade. They had already established, um, which I'm going to talk about briefly, islands off the coast of Africa and were going toward the next level of development, which they saw in Brazil. Now, why is this uh, critical? A couple things. I want you to notice some similarities. Did you already see the axis that we're talking about? Scorpio opposing uh, the ascendant in Scorpio opposing the sun conjoined to Neptune. We also have this moon connected to that Uranus in that particular point. And even if we didn't know about the first Africans chart, what we see is that the disciplinarian, the structured Saturn, is exactly square to the ascendant and also to the sun and Neptune. It's almost at a midpoint. What that would suggest is that the idea of dealing with enterprise and a disciplined enterprise, and I'm putting it mildly, to say the least, is what was at the heart of the discovery of Brazil. It wasn't just for pure enjoyment or pleasure, it was to create something, a major enterprise. And then I want to use this last chart or reference this last chart. This is the U.S. Declaration of Independence. 
Um, July 4th, 1776, 5.10 p.m., Philadelphia, PA. This is known as the Sibley chart. Now, most of you probably know, or some of you at least will know, most of you know this is a fictional chart, right? To some degree, right? And since then, I say it's a fictional chart. Sibley, it's believed that it's not clear, took the time and projected it for London, not necessarily using local time in Philadelphia. So the actual angles for this chart um, are almost improbable for that particular time and region per se, when it was actually signed. So there are many different charts for the United States. Right? That's what I'm going to say. If you're, I know of at least just off top four that people like to use. Some of them are for July 4th. Some of them are for the Articles of Confederation. Some of them are earlier um, to, for when they believe it's signed. But why use this chart? Because I think it becomes a statement about this country, the Sagittarius rising country, right? In terms of like an enter, expansiveness, all these wonderful things. The, the moon is going toward late Aquarius, um, as versus if it were earlier in the day. But one thing that's always impressed me as I learned more about astrology, which I'm gonna, I'll bring back to your attention in a second, is look at the sun at 13 degrees Cancer. Um, there's some other elements that we'll tie together later. But that particular point, the sun, is tied to one of the most powerful stars, big stars, that we have, the Bahadian stars, which is Sirius. I'm going to correct myself. It's like, well, I, I thought you were joking. No, I mean, like, Sirius. <laughs> and even the star is, is Sirius, the dog star, which I'm going to talk more about. Going back for a second, we'll just zoom in. Oh, in fact, near, near this one. You will see that the chart for the first Africans is at 12 degrees of Capricorn, which means the South Node, where one loses, where one has like a, as some people describe it, a karmic sensibility, where one is kind of drawn to the past, that means it's at 12 degrees of Cancer. Exactly conjoined to that Sirius and exactly conjoined to the Sun. What do I mean? I mean that the South Node for these first Africans was tied, the experience of loss, the experience of karma, was tied to the American Sun. On some level, like I say, if you were just looking at this as state as if there were two people, you know, if I were counseling one of my you know, clients, I would say, girl, you don't lose here. <laughs> All right, oh, one other chart I did want to share very quickly that I think was strange when I was looking at it. So you might ask, who's Virginia Gare? Virginia Gare is an actual person, right? Her name is Virginia Gare. Why? Well, she was the first native-born person in America, to our knowledge, in Roanoke, Virginia. Now, I found that interesting because I've looked at different American charts, the Sibley chart being one of them, but what I hadn't looked at was like one particular individual. And what I want you to take note of is that it's August 28th, 1587, Roanoke, Virginia. But note, and this is a hypothetical time. We do not have a rectified time, so it's not an actual time. So ignore the angles. But the sun's position for that day, roughly toward five degrees, is almost exactly conjoined to the first Africans chart. In terms of income. So there's almost like a tie to this place in Virginia, almost like a meeting point. Venus is also in Leo in that same chart. Mercury's are conjoined along with the North Node. And so we'll talk about the Mercury theme. Um, ignore the rising sign, but Mars is in Scorpio again, right? And so we'll get back to, to Mars. So, and, and Pluto here is conjoined to the Jupiter uh, for the first Africans chart. So I just wanted to give you some highlights of how this all connects together. Is, are people completely lost? And it's okay to say yes. Makes it sense some, somewhat in terms of connections? Yeah. Let's move on. So let's talk about a summary right quick. So we see strong related themes, even if only related by rectification and conjecture. So Scorpio is where we experience you know, for those who are driven to uh, Scorpio through Pluto, more depth 
the idea of the experience of going into the deep. And we're talking about Mars, it's emotional. In some way, we're also talking about emotional, uh, even aspects of emotional violence, or the war within oneself, or the war that one happens between others, right? Um, in terms of some of the Scorpio themes. There's a strong Mars Saturn sensibility that comes up, and we'll see this more and more. And Mars Saturn, um, I like Alan Oken's description, especially with when you're talking about either the opposition or the square, it's like driving with the brakes on. It's feeling like the level of restriction, it's feeling the level of stoppage, um, it's feeling limitations, but having to kind of push through the limitations. One of the charts that I hope we have time to look at will be Dr. King's chart, and he has a Mars Saturn opposition. And one of the things that I have always found beautiful about his chart and that Mars opposition is that just think about the idea of nonviolence, where you're dealing with Saturn, which is about stop, right? And Mars is about action. In some way in which you have to deal with resistance in some proactive, steady way. It's kind of like, okay, we're going to get through this by inches, but we're going to get through this with persistence. There's an emphasis on Venus and Mercury, which is what I might describe as the experience of pleasure and thought. I will clarify that. I know it sounds like, yo, no, you know, it wasn't pleasurable to be in a slave after him, right? Or even like in terms of conditioning of thought, but I will get to that. Just keep that as a mental note. Experiences of pleasure and thought for Venus and Mercury, because again, you might remember um, these indigenous Africans came in during a Mercury rulership, meaning that this Virgo is one of the signs that's ruled by Mercury. So they came in during that particular time, and Venus is at the top of the chart in Leo. I think that's very significant. From indentured servitude to enslavement. So blood for a grain of taste. The Crusades introduced Europeans to the wonders of spices and refinement, as I said, with sugarcane, especially the ability to crystallize the plant into the sweet salt. As Spain and Portugal threw off you know, Moorish rule, they established just off the coast of Africa, the Canary Islands, Madeira, Madeira uh, Sao Tome, Principe. They were focused on developing one major crop, and that's sugarcane, uh, exporting to other parts of Europe for consumption and refinement. Now, this is huge. And I think some folks don't realize like, how big this really becomes because it goes to this next point, and one point I make a little later. Um, one thing I didn't mention in my bio, and I probably should say a little bit about myself other than what Patricia was able to read, I have two degrees in African American studies, and um, when I came to astrology, I was in a PhD program pursuing uh, my degree in African American studies. And at that particular point, I was 23 at my, my second degree return. And at that particular point, um, I was in an Afrocentric program, the first Afrocentric PhD program at Temple University of its kind in the world at the time. And many people, including myself at that time, believed that enslavement happened mainly because, um, on more personal terms, the white people didn't like us. They were jealous of us. Um, and they wanted our melody, all these other things. I'm not going to go and say that's completely false. But I will say this that is even more disconcerting. It wasn't that personal. It was more so even just cheap labor. Um, and so just off the, when you just say off the coast of Africa, I mean literally off the coast of Africa in terms of these islands. And to trade for guns, for internecine wars and things that were happening on the continent, there were other Africans who, yes, were selling other Africans. And anyone else they could find, by the way. Because we're pirates, you know, they, they would sell North Africans, Europeans, whoever they got their hands on, to be able to sell in order to get these goods. And then, for cheap labor, they were taken to these islands. And this is not just a, a matter of, you know, when I say here, down here, the cultivation of sugarcane sets the precedent and template for savage agricultural, agricultural practices and the explosion of the slave trade. You have to understand there was a whole process of slash and burn, reducing like pristine areas. Um, and we're gonna see this again when we get to the new world. When I say pristine, whole forests and whole people who may have been in those forests were burned down 
in order to cultivate sugarcane. And then to take the people from Africa to work the land. Now you might say this is more true for when, it, when we come to the Caribbean and the Americas. Well, why didn't they use like the natives there or you know bring in people? Am I going to like go for someone in Europe who's going to expect a livable wage where I can get someone who's a slave? You know, someone who's enslaved and cheap labor? What about the natives? Because it's this whole idea of the natives, the neighbor, uh, the, the natives, they, fought. they were the noble savage. That's not exactly what happened. Those who survived the European diseases that they had never been exposed to in their history, those who survived, when they were enslaved, two things would happen. One, they knew the land better than the Europeans and could escape. And then the other issue is the Europeans didn't want them on that land in the first place. So they were most times removed and moved into hinterlands or just killed. And so they would bring the enslaved Africans again to work this land. This is huge to understand in that sense that it's going to go back to a point I'm going to make about a particular planet here um, in the development of what happened in, in the progress of enslavement. It's because when we teach it, when they teach it in school, when we learn it in school, we talk about the triangular slave trade and getting for wrong, blah, blah, blah. And it sounds, you know, all very orderly, right, and sophisticated. But it really starts off with someone wanting sugar in their damn tea. Again, this is the first Africans chart, but I want to show you another one, um, which is interesting. Now, I use whole sign houses, so this is a bit confusing. This is actually for five days, if you can zoom in again. This is for five days earlier, and this is for 12.06 p.m., 1619 in Hampton, Virginia. One thing that's powerful is that Mars is still opposite to Pluto. So that's a consistent thing. This is rectified. I'm sorry, I don't want to forget this. This is, if you could zoom out for a second, I'm going to give him credit. This is rectified by Vernon Robinson, Jr., and it was at Norway 2016. I want to make sure. No, yeah, for the chart. So it is different. The moon is in Pisces, so it is a full moon. Mercury is conjoined to the midheaven, so in whole sign houses, the midheaven gets moved elsewhere. You know, it would be in the 11th house, the 10th house, or the 9th. Um, so this is a slightly different chart. Mercury is in a different position. It's at 14 degrees rather than 23. But Jupiter is pretty much at the same position, and now squared to the nodes, but it is at the north bending, which we'll come to talk to talk about a little later. But I will tell you, in my opinion, I wouldn't say that August 30th is the absolute correct date, right? We don't really know. I would say somewhere between the two, maybe it's like the 27th or the 28th, and I think more so with the moon and Taurus, I think that's probably more the, the, the proper date in time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I'm, but I wanted to ask you, which one do you feel more? Do you feel like the first one I showed you or this one? This one? Well, we'll, we'll go through it. Um, when I say go through it, I'll go through other charts. But I was curious to see what people thought. This is a different, like I said, a different time. The, the sun is at one degree of Virgo as versus at four or five or six, actually. So it's, it's, it's different. So I want to share something about Venus, because Venus, I believe, the reason why I like the chart I first showed you, my first rectified chart based on some of the work of Mark Penfield, where Venus is conjoined to the midheaven, Venus, I would say, like also creates dislike. So this is based on the work of an astrologer, maybe some of you have heard of him, Nick Dagan Best. He's correlated challenges of injustice and racism to African Americans with the cycle of Venus. So when Venus is close to her superior conjunction, I'll explain that in just a second, and her subsequent retrograde as an evening star, he's found that it's coincided with months with strong periods of unrest between black and white Americans, especially when the superior conjunction or retrograde has been Virgo or Libra, which happens 
as we think of it. Best tracks this from 1831 to 1919. And the explosion, for instance, of the Black Lives Matter movement from Ferguson, Missouri, erupts from the October 2014, uh, 2014 superior conjunction of Venus at a solar eclipse, no less. Um, which kind of supports this point. So he only went to 1999, but I actually have some other points that support this. Now, Venus also relates to the sweetness of life. Hence the beginning of our journey with sugar. Which is why I think it fits to have Venus at the top of that car. Now in Virginia, let's be clear, what were they developing? Tobacco, right? But why is that relevant in relation to sugar? Because sugar sets the template for everything that becomes chattel slavery in in North America, in the Americas period. Yeah, he was also representing the money that people were making out from through slavery that's and true. all the property. Yeah. Thing that that's if you assign right if there, you sign money to Venus, yeah. that's one thing yeah, you would also say. Yeah, you can. Now let me explain a couple terms that some may not be as familiar with. What's a superior conjunction? So there's an interior or inferior conjunction where the planet is perceived to be closer to Earth. And that's like between Earth and the Sun, and that's called an inferior conjunction. It has nothing with the planet being inferior. It's believed that superior is that between the Sun going toward Mars, right? The, the Sun was placed at the center of the galaxy, or let's say the center, um, more so. I guess that's still true in that sense. Um, Earth, it goes Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars. So when the planet goes on the other side toward Mars, it's going toward the superior side. So when Venus is an evening star, she's more toward the superior side on the other side of the Earth. And then for Mercury and Venus, both of those planets, when they are evening stars, are preparing to go retrograde. And then they're going toward a rebirth. So that's what I'm talking about with Venus and that particular point. So here's an example of a chart. This particular chart um, that you see, let me just get here. I'm going to point out a few things here. That chart is looking at the particular moment that Venus went retrograde just before um, the uh, for um, George Zimmerman when he was found not guilty. So you will see it is a Venus Gemini um, retrograde. Leo is rising. What's interesting about that, it is exactly square to the first African's Mercury, which is at 23 degrees of Virgo. The other thing that's also interesting about this is that you see Mercury up there. This is ruling of Venus. Guess where it is in the first African's chart? It's between the Mercury, between the Pluto and the Moon. Again, that chart seems to kind of correlate and time with some events that happen in African American history. So, summary: with Venus as a clear signifier in the first African's chart, and according to the ideas presented by Nick Degan Best, we might we might see racism and its capitalistic roots as a statement about consumption, taste, and affinity. Let me explain the last part in terms of affinity. Remember, Venus is where we create some measure of kinship and connection. One thing that we must acknowledge, especially in the Americas, is that we never really kind of formalize a sense of how we establish kinship as Americans. We just have a general idea of it. Like we have these principles, but other countries have like a history, like we're, we're German, right? Or, you know, we're Irish, or we're Ghanaian, right? In terms of how we have a sensibility. But our challenge has been some measure of how we construct affinity has been largely tied to these other things as well. Consumption, who consumes what and why, and a matter of taste. So one of the horrors of enslavement isn't that enslavers were anti-black as much as so enamored with their own tastes and affinities, each other, that they didn't care who or what had to suffer to maintain their tastes and time. 
So how do we broaden that sense of taste in their culture? I don't have an answer for that. This is a question I'm presenting to you. Resistance. So this is important because I just want to kind of go through some of this, um, not too slow and not too fast. Because many have the idea that with enslaved Africans, well, they were just enslaved, right? And they were not realizing they fought. We fought. All kinds of fights. You know, from what didn't like what we might describe now as passive aggressive ways of fighting. Like, you know, like, okay, yeah, I'm working the field. Hey, we're like you just slow down, you know, we usually do it if not someone was going to whip you for it, right? However, you can do it to outright um, rebellion, as we see in August 14, 1791. 6 p.m. is an estimated time. I say estimated because the rebellion started after a, a voodoo or a voodoo ritual that night. So I'm putting that at an early end of 6 because it went, I think it even kind of was at its height toward 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock. So I'm thinking the ritual might have been like between 6 and 7 p.m. And this is in Haitian Haiti. So this particular chart roughly has some of the key positions. You'll see that the moon is in Pisces. Anyone notice anything significant about that degree or moment? It's directly opposite to that first African sun. And then we also see that Pluto, again, if that's around the time, is an Aquarius um, square to the Pluto. Um, Mars is square to the Jupiter of the first African's chart. Saturn is on that. And what's really most important is that that particular north node um, at 13 Libra is square or has a challenging relationship almost exactly to the first African's north node. So I think that's another point of connection. But the simplest one, I want you again to notice this because I'm going to come back to this. When does it happen? August 14th. Right? You're like, okay. August 14th. That's not okay. That's not okay. That's not okay. But it might be like, well, who cares? Why is that important? Well, we're kind of just keep in your mind August. So I when uh, Jim Bear was born in August, too. Yes, she was. So, how many of you have heard of Palmares or oh, Quilombo? So, Quilombos were points of resistance in Brazil. There were communities of Africans. Some, this particular one in Palmares um, had a whole sequence of, of uh, villages connected, but a prime fortification was Palmares, um, of 200,000 Africans who had escaped to be able to live together in this particular region. Now think about that for a second. Does that mean that doesn't sound that big, right, to us, with, you know, especially to a New Yorker and you know, a city with millions, right? 200,000 is fast. I mean, like, you think about how many people might be in your building if you live in a high rise, you know, like, there could be, like, you know, some people with, like, a thousand in New York. A thousand people seems like a lot of people you will never meet. Imagine 200,000. So, this is the destruction of that particular place. And there's not a lot here. <laughs> you know, like, might even ask, like, well, why are we talking about it? Because I wanted to point out some things that are, um, this particular place, Palmares, actually had been under siege for about two weeks. What's interesting about that is that you will note the sun, and this is the estimated time, this is not an average time. You'll note that the sun, if you could zoom in for me, thank you. The sun is at 18 degrees Aquarius, which means that about 18 days prior, it was opposite to this Pluto. And the Brazilians have been looking to break Palmares after many defeats since 1691. So the other thing that's significant, especially if you look at that sun, it's opposite to the Venus for the first Africans chart. Um, I think what also is very powerful is that the moon is going toward this conjunction with Jupiter and Mars. Uh, so what I see here is that there was this attempt to really break the spirit of the Africans in Brazil. Now, with the with the destruction of the Quilombos, and it's even rumored, I don't know if this is actually true in terms of actual history, it's always near in terms of history, 
is that Palmares also was where Capoeira was also supposed to develop. So when you see Capoeira and you see people doing different dances and motions, that some measure of that may have been refined. I don't know if it was created in Palmares. And I think what's significant about understanding this particular moment is just remember what I said about Ayan and the people there. The greatest number of Africans outside of Africa is in Brazil. And I think in terms of the challenge that the Brazilian Africans are enduring, which is very different than what we are enduring here as African Americans, um, may, may also relate to this particular moment where Palmares was kind of broken apart. And just quickly put it plain for those who have not been to Brazil or familiar with Brazilian culture, many of the Africans in Brazil are doing worse than how we might describe our condition here as African Americans. Nat Turner's rebellion, you can zoom in. August 21st, 1831. We can take a pretty good guess. It was the afternoon. I don't know if it was 12 in the afternoon, but Southampton, Virginia. So, anything significant stand out to you about this chart? Or this, that date? Saturn before Fort Yep. Saturn. Saturn before Fort Virgo. Yeah, what else? Wait, wait. What did you say? The date. The date. The same date as the great American eclipse in 2007. Exactly. It is the same date, and just maybe even around the same time, we also had some folks, you know, talking about they will not be erased. Just a little ways away from Southampton, Virginia. The other thing is that, and I'll talk about this, is that Fannie Lou Hamer, who was, um, you know, many of you might remember her or know of her in terms of her struggle with the Democratic Party. She gives a speech uh, at the Democratic Convention in 1964. I talked about this um, on August 22nd, 1964. So this date, and one, one thing to also know about this, I'm not going to get too much into the astrology of it. What you said, remind me of your name again? Erica. Erica. What you said is that the Great American Eclipse actually falls on the heels in almost the same degree as as the eclipse that set Nat Turner in motion to have his rebellion. Now, for those who know more in depth astrology, it is not on the same sorrow cycle, but it's when you have a similar degree, you have to pay attention. Okay, I also wanted to throw in the Emancipation Proclamation. So, I believe this is more the accurate time because it went into effect January 1st, 1863, Washington, D.C. Um, one thing I find funny, maybe this is like morbid astrological humor, Saturn <laughs> rising in Libra. I mean, he's exalted, right? Yeah. So, but I'm like, the Emancipation Proclamation of Saturn's rising, you, know, the you had an African astrologer looking at that, like, is he free? <laughs> <laughs> Which is a real question, considering that it took another two years for that to go fully into effect. So Saturn rising is significant in terms of like eventually. Kind of slowed it down a little bit. Yeah. yeah, but it is exalted, <laughs> which is interesting. Also, you see that there's a Saturn Neptune opposition. But one thing to pay attention to, and I'll come back to this, is 10 degrees of Capricorn uh, for the Sun conjoined to Venus. Um, in terms of the first African chart, I mean, the Jupiter is square to the Uranus. Um, I'm not, there's not, aren't a lot of parallels. I mean, Uranus does have a connection to Saturn. Um, but that's not why I'm just showing you this. It's like to kind of find more of a pattern in terms of how these things come together. One thing that is significant is the Pluto return. You see that? Pluto is returned to Taurus. The same as the 1690. <laughs> you can't frame that. Like you can't make that up. So that literally is the return. So what's the big deal? So 10th degree of Capricorn, legendary astrologer, and I'm going to tie in a couple things here. Let me just get to that, that point in my notes. 
So legendary astrologer um, Charabel describes nine Capricorn as an owl sitting in the moonlight. Now I want to be clear about something. When you're talking about using something like Sabian symbols, you actually have to go the degree above. So it's like I'm talking about nine degrees, even like one minute, I'm going to 10, 10 Capricorn. So he describes it, it is the index of a mind that is wise and patient, prudent and self-possessed. Where others see nothing, he will discern many indications of the trend of events. He may study astronomy and become a discoverer of things occult or distant. His life and work are centered in the things that are hidden from the common eye, and in the hours of the night he will lie, will lie the greatest dangers of his life, as also things that are remote from sense. Now, like, well, what's that got to do with the African experience? I think a lot. Okay, no, people were not necessarily diviners using astrology. I think they were diviners in other things. But in terms of dealing with the dark and dealing, as he also says, in the hours of the night will lie the greatest dangers of his life, I think that's an apt description. This idea of nine, ten degrees cancer Capricorn is a recurrent theme. Now, you will see this theme in a couple of places. Um, the midheaven at nine degrees cancer, which you just saw in that chart. Nine degree cancer also figures largely in the chart of Alex Haley for his Pluto. Storytelling Mercury was transiting at nine Capricorn when Roots first aired, 123, 1977. The US solar arc was directed to nine Capricorn when Roots was published. Again, another clue related to this, this theme. Oh, press that. So Black August. Black August refers to a particular moment of prison at San Quentin on, on 8-21-1971. This is also when the first indigenous Africans arrived in, in Virginia. This is when Gabriel Prosser and Nat Turner both had their state governments. Black nationalist Marcus Mosiah Garvey was born in that month. The Underground Railroad was formed that month. <clears throat> Dr. Martin Luther King delivered his famous I Have a Dream speech at the March on Washington in 1963. W.E.B. Du Bois passed away again in August. And then I just talked about Annie Lou Hamer on page 22. Why? So, the, so why would this happen? The dog star. Sirius at 14 cancer now, not throughout all of history, um, is so called because it's in the Canis Major constellation, what we call the Big Book. Sodpet, which is the Kemetic or Egyptian name, is how the star was personified and known in ancient Egypt. There the stars rising along with the annual flooding of the Nile mark the beginning of the Egyptian New Year. So check this next part. Sodpet is also said to be the wife of Sabu, the hidden one, and the constellation of Orion, right? Orion's bell and Orion. And mother of the falcon god Sodpu, skilled man who is Venus. Venus is birthed from this dog star. Now the dog star also again serious, is where we get the idea of dog days of summer, right? And I remember, and if you know of an old movie for those who are a little older, remember this movie, Dog Day Afternoon? Okay, so I was a kid, so I went to see that the drive-in. Drive-in, remember drive-in? Yeah, we have drive-ins down here, right? Still? Right? There's a few relics. Okay, few of them. But I fell asleep because I was like, it was too adult for me, and I'm glad I actually did, because it's like, man, you're robbing a bank so you can have a sex change. What? <laughs> and that's what the movie is about. But given with Dog Day afternoon, I mean, I asked my mom, why do they call it Dog Day? It's like, oh, because you like, can't like a dog during those particular times of the year. Mom wasn't right. <laughs> but you get the idea, it's hot. So what happens now, and it has been true for several hundreds of years, it rises before the sun in the northern hemisphere in August. Roughly around August 2nd or 3rd now. This particular star is also venerated among the Dogon people 
in Burkina Faso, West Africa. Okay. So Sirius marks immense creative talents in any field at all, with only the warning that here may be more inner power than can be safely managed. We have here the star of, the, of truly great figures in every field of human endeavor. It deals with, and some people believe they're even Syrians, meaning that they come from the planet, um, and star series or that, that system, but even with the idea that you're tapped into a greater power. <laughs> now, those who knew astrology, and I do believe some of my founding fathers knew astrology, um, I don't think it's an accident that they chose that linkage to the star in terms of the sun being at that particular position. I also don't think completely that it's an accident that the south node and the north node also falls on that axis for the first axis and the challenge related to that. So I just need to check the time. No, I can't even watch on. So I have to. Okay, so I, I have until nine, right? Okay, everyone. <laughs> key figures. I want to talk about some people. So, so I before you zoom in, just zoom out for a second, then I'm gonna give credit. So this is a rectified chart by an astrologer. His name is Amir Bey, based in New York. And he gave me his permission to use this rectification. Thank you. Um, I want to talk about why I'm rectifying or why it was rectified and rectified. Um, the date that Frederick Douglass used to celebrate his birthday, because he didn't know when he was born, is February 14th, Valentine's Day. So that's the date you will mostly see for Frederick Douglass. What I found intriguing about this chart, you, if you might see some obvious things, one is that the Sun and Saturn are both opposites of the first African's chart. So I was like, okay, that fits. Because if you're not familiar with Frederick Douglass, he was the most notable abolitionist and black orator of his era. And I'm talking about the 19th century. When I say abolitionist, I mean doggedly going for the destruction of enslavement of his people, both in the South and in, in the North. And he escaped from his own enslavement. So, I mean, oops. Um, sorry. So I think there's a couple of things that stand out about this chart that, you know, I haven't tested it myself in terms of all particular events in his life. But, I mean, you can definitely see some key aspects of the divide square between the moon and Uranus um, in terms of for freedom. He's definitely dealing with the agitation for people's freedom of Mars and the moon. Mars is rising. And so you see the man, and he has like a very pugnacious sensibility, very dignified. I think that's also the sun at the top of the chart. Um, and in terms of his eloquence, he has a morning star Mercury at six degrees. That fits a very powerful thing in the first African star, which is a connection to Venus. It's directly opposite that. You will see that again. I'll come back to that point with someone else. All right, so let's talk about some of these people. And I might go through these a little faster. This is Booker T. Washington. So Booker T. Washington is also from the late 19th century into the early 20th century. He is the founder of the Tuskegee Institute. Um, he was perhaps the go-to race man for the early um, 20th century, the late 19th century. And we're not completely certain of his time or date of birth, but as you can see here, strong Aries signature. But he also has this very powerful connection, especially to with Jupiter, to the first Africans, Mercury. So in terms of speaking about um, the level of industry, you know, he was very much into African people not necessarily having to go for civil rights, but economic wealth and power. So that was this in education. In education. What you will notice is that he also connects to that first African start in Pluto, the Pluto and Taurus. He's a Pluto return. 
One thing I'm sure many of you might be aware of, we've studied astrology for a while. When we look at our needle charts, we tend to think about more so just ourselves, and maybe we might think about our own personal narratives through, if you believe in reincarnation, <coughs> our past lives. But what I have learned in terms of studying African American studies and different work is a, is a slightly different idea of this, is that you are also the manifestation of a cycle. You are a reflection of a moment in history. So for instance, for me to be like the first African American to sit on ESAR's board, right, and for all that, one thing I'm keenly aware of is that it's taken generations of blood to make me, for me to be where I am. It's taken generations of blood for you to be you. So in terms of this particular time frame for Booker T. Washington, you know, in terms of him being a Pluto return for these first Africans, it took a lot for Booker T. Washington to come into existence. Irrespective of how he differed with W.E.B. Du Bois, for instance, who we're going to cover next, or get to, um, no matter how much you want to differ with, like, oh, he, he negated civil rights, he is part of a tapestry in our history. And we're all part of the, the weaving of it. The weaving never stops. Speaking of W.E.B. Du Bois, now, this, this man's life and this man impresses me not because he was so educated. That's important. He was very proud of his education. He believed that the most important thing for Africans and African Americans to achieve was education. I actually, this is my personal opinion and I'm owning it as such, I actually can see some better of the wisdom of Booker T in reflection compared to Du Bois. Du Bois is like, let's get educated and focus on civil rights. Whereas, uh, you can say Booker T was like, know how to lay some bricks and make those white people come to you so they pay for the bricks. <laughs> and so we can build up more of their houses and they pay us, right? And we have more. I actually can understand that dimension of it. But what you can see in terms of this chart is that look at his son. At four degrees, directly opposite to that first African's chart. And what's significant about Du Bois is that he was born in 1868, he dies in 1963. He almost lived 100 years, and one of his biographers, David Levering Lewis, actually subtitled his book on W.E.B. Du Bois as a biography of a race. Some measure of his life history does run in tandem especially with the development of African people from the 19th century into the 20th. Because he got to the middle. Yes. I have a hard time with him. We do I don't have a time. No. But they're both the amendments. They are. Yeah. That was interesting. And they both have a high concentration. And they also have, let me just point this out. You see that Mercury, Jupiter? And Booker T is older. So, they both have it, so I think in a lot of ways we're very similar. He also has the Pluto almost exactly conjoined, so he has actually almost exact Pluto return mm -hmm. to the actual degree. Yeah. Um, his, his Neptune is on the first African Jupiter, so we might say that he had a vision for America that's based on his, that indentured servitude. He did um, an immense amount of writing on enslavement, and I mean, I have to give him kudos here. I mean, he did a lot of the work um, related to Clark Atlanta, right? So that's where he worked. And also did a lot of work here in Atlanta. Um, if you ever are into reading something more about, you know, if you live here in the city, um, I would read, I can't remember the actual chi uh, chapter uh, number, but there is a, a chapter titled about Atlanta or Atlanta. So it means we believe that Atlanta is named after Atalanta, which is a goddess. So it's like, um, it's in his book, Souls of Black Folk. Who's this? Marcus Garvey, right? So we have Marcus Garvey. Again, I want you to point out or see that we're talking about same moons. His moon is in Leo. Although we do not have a birth time for him, I'm, I'm more inclined to believe that he did have a moon in Leo. Um, we have his. North node, roughly near to the degree within seven of the Venus for the first African's chart. He doesn't have a lot of connections to that chart. Jupiter 
does fall in the first half of that chart. But why I think Garvey is significant, you know, in terms of lessons is all that Leo. And you might remember in the first Africans chart, Leo's at the top of the chart. And so I think what Garvey really kind of points to, especially related to the Venus, is the idea of being proud of one's blackness. You know, and I think that was significant because that wasn't necessarily the message of those previous two men. Even though Garvey was very inspired by Booker T, in fact, he came from Jamaica to America to meet Booker T, but Booker T had just died and didn't meet him. Um, so he developed a whole program that eventually took off all around the world of Pan-Africanism with the idea of returning black people here back to Africa, the repatriation um, movement and moment. And, you know, where you see the red, black, and green flag, you know, in terms of Pan-Africanism in Africa, that's the man who coined that and created that first. Now, what's interesting in, in another time, in another lecture, to look between these two men's charts, you know, his Mars, um, also in terms of looking at you know, his Mars, which are kind of in conjunct. Um, it would be funny to look at these two. Why? Because the man we believe, many scholars believe, who actually grounded Marcus Garvey and had him arrested for tax evasion is this man. It's believed that we dined him out. And, you know, you can say it was a petty jealousy. I think what's interesting is W.E.B. Du Bois saw him as a fraud. Now, what I see as a distinction between these two is more so that Du Bois lived out really his Saturn um, square um, to his sun and his moon. And he really focused on the idea of discipline through learning because he believed with that Saturn and Sag, everything got funneled through that Jupiter. And Jupiter is kind of one of the, the key, if not the um, final expositor in this chart. Everything kind of answers to that Jupiter. And when you have that, it becomes a lot about scholarship and how you observe the motion and change of things. He had a lot more connects, and one of the things he kind of changed a lot faster and move things faster. And I think that was kind of the grounding for their disparity. Um, one other person who had a chart like this in terms of the Saturn and the Sun and looking at the, the evolution of things in that particular way, and I'm using that term on purpose, is Charles Darwin. All right, Malcolm X, who we talked about earlier. Malcolm has a fascinating chart in one, a couple of particular ways. One, we'll see that the Saturn really does connect to that first African's chart in the first house. But we have the Mars-Pluto connection in terms of dealing with them. What I haven't said already is that the Mars-Pluto opposition that you see in that first African's chart is dealing with violence, right? And the violence of taking enslaved people or people and enslaving them, right? And I'm always very careful to say, you might notice I say enslaved Africans, because I don't like to just say slaves. These people were, you know, our people were not just, you know, like we got some slaves from Africa. They were people who were much like us, if not completely like us, in terms of having jobs, homes. Um, some had high stations, some had very low stations, but they weren't slaves. They were in slavery. And that Mars Pluto is not just talking about perhaps the violence that he may have endured. And this time is actually believed to be correct from his birth certificate. So uh, he is believed to be a Capricorn rising with a Mars and Pluto. And you'll notice that that's not too far from that nine degrees that I talked about, that 10 degrees of Capricorn um, in terms of that particular point. Uh, he, he also has, you know, along the Scorpio uh, Taurus axis, his Mercury and his Sun. And what I think is powerful is that his Mercury is, the, is completely opposite to the Scorpio rising chart from the first Africans. So when you listen to Malcolm and you listen to his eloquence, I think that is also what we're talking about with that Mercury there. Oh, and one other, oops, going fast. One other thing that's powerful, yeah, we're back. 
is that I did that. Okay. Sorry. Is that that north node is on the Venus for the first African to try. All right, let me go on to um I won't say it's nemesis, but it's often it's often framed as nemesis, but I, I think it's unfair. Dr. King, I think Malcolm said something to this effect, or maybe it was Dr. King, but I'm not complaining. With it. But Malcolm said, Dr. King, or he said, I made Dr. King possible. Meaning because you have a choice between me or him. Right? So you have the guy who says by any means necessary, right? And who believed that there could be a separate but equal America, right? And the guy who wanted to deal with the idea of, of a different vision of America. So what you know, we have Dr. King, January 15th, 1929, 12 p.m. that is believed to be correct. Um, you're in Atlanta, Georgia. You will notice that that Mercury is fairly close to the Venus of the first Africans chart. So, I mean, he captured with eloquence. His Jupiter is directly opposite to the ascendant for the first Africans chart, even though directed by time. His, his ascendant is, you know, situated right between that Pluto and the moon. So I think in terms of dealing with, you know, the aspects of power and injustice, I think he spoke greatly to that. Um, his sun is directly opposite to the Uranus in the first African's chart, which is at 26 degrees Cancer. What does that mean, sun opposite Uranus? He was your way with it. He was saying to America, you know, not just I have a dream and go to sleep, but wake up. Let's have a dream. Let's make a dream. I'm also going to talk about revisioning, re-envisioning the dream. This is Fannie Lou Hamer. Um, you know, I believe this is more of a, this is not her actual time chart, I believe. Um, just in terms of some particular things that I think that really do stand out is that her Saturn is connected to that Venus. I also felt it was important to highlight you know, especially with this north node here, how much of a fighter she was, that Mars-Saturn, unlike King had the Mars-Saturn opposition. You know, it's like how she was plodding along to make things happen um, in terms of what was happening in Mississippi. She also, the reason why she was at the Democratic Party convention is because Mississippi sent a delegation that didn't have black people. So she framed her own delegation and went there and said, we will, you will acknowledge us at this delegation at this particular convention and insist on it. So that Mars Saturn gives stamina and focus. This chart is, you know, you have to forgive me, I just got a little emotional about it. I mean, I remember that day when Barack Obama was elected president. Um, and you know, it's a, it's, it's a different day, different president. Um, it was a, it was, a, I don't know how you felt in that particular day, but what I remember that night when he was elected, I was like, maybe America can change. Maybe I can see a different America. And I think we did. <laughs> I think we did. But, <laughs> But what, what's significant about Obama's chart in terms of some particular things is that he has this connection, you know, from his election to the Saturn. But in terms of an actual chart, I think you look at his Mercury, it's squared to that to the ascendant, but the sun is connected to that Venus. Um, the sun at 12 degrees of Leo. And it's at the top of the chart for the first African's chart, which I think is very important and powerful. His Neptune figures into the ascendant. And I mean, I can go more into a critical analysis of Obama in relation to African American people. Um, but one thing I will say is I think this chart, especially if you look at the North Node on his mid heaven, I think that was a galvanizing moment, especially dealing with Scorpio being at the top of his chart and then the sun is Scorpio. Where for the first African's chart, it was like the fulfillment 
not just of autonomous, but maybe the first iteration of, of, a, of a transition, of a shift. I will talk about what I think that shift is, because I am going to get to what I think the destiny is, but I think that's what we're capturing in that moment. I do want to mention briefly a few other moments that may seem trivial, but I think they are significant. <coughs> so this is Ryan Kugler's chart, whose chart is known, if you can spare focus in at the top. I just want to give his time. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll go forward and help you. Here you go. Yeah, yeah. He was born May 23rd, 1986, 5.43 p.m., Oakland, California. This is the premiere of Black Panther for February 16, 2018, 7.30 p.m. in Los Angeles, California. The time is kind of conjecture, but I also, um, I use Chad Boswick's um, Twitter for where he took the photo for where Black Panther took over one of the Arc Light Theater in Los Angeles. And it was 7.30, so that's the time, the reason why I used that particular. Now you might wonder, Sam, who cares about Black Panther? One, I don't know if many people can appreciate it. I mean, I think maybe, have you seen it? Many of you? Okay. Why I think it's significant, that movie is the first movie directed by a black director that made a billion dollars worldwide. One. Two, it is like one of the highest grossing films, or even superhero films, um, perhaps ever. I mean, I think it's the second or first. That's the second point. The third point that is somewhat trivial, I mean, they also played, this is not trivial, but they, they played around the world um, in all parts of Africa, for example, and other places. But going along with, and this is my fourth point, it played in Saudi Arabia. Now you're like, okay, but in Saudi Arabia. They didn't play movies in Saudi Arabia. Movies were forbidden. Haram. I'm a Muslim. They don't know. You don't they don't do it. You might like why. Okay, I shouldn't laugh. But many many Muslims, especially in Saudi Arabia, believe in terms of replicating images that it takes away from Allah. So for this to play in Saudi Arabia after they had premiered a movie like that is huge. Now, what's significant about the film? You can just like zoom out for this chart a little bit toward down. Yeah. One, Ryan Kugler's chart. Just look at what we're doing with him. Scorpio rising. He's a Scorpio rising. We got also Mercury in the sun. And then his midheaven and even the North Node for the premiere of the film, dealing with that Leo Aquarius axis again. So it's playing out that particular moment. Pluto is on his Mars. I think that's more personal to him um, in terms of that kind of coming like a Herculean moment to make something happen. But again, we find the Mars Saturn conjunction in terms of like the steady and sure, you know, moving forward with the race. And that, when I say race, I don't mean just us, I mean like literally in terms of moving forward. So I, I thought this was a significant chart. There's one other chart I want you to pay attention to. And I actually think, I mean, I, I, I like Ryan Kugler, I like his work, but the one I think you should watch out for, um, and you already have reason to watch out for her, is Ava DuVernay. August 24, 1972, we have 5.22 um, p.m., Long Beach, California. This is the premiere of Selma on the outside. Um, she is a Capricorn rising Virgo, but if you can zoom in again, wait for me. Notice where her sun and Mars is. And then what her moon is, like even a full moon. So this works for both the first Africans chart, the one that I prefer, and then the other one that Vernon Robinson did. It works for both. I actually think what I'm predicting, even looking at this chart, I think she's going to make another movie um, in her directing career that will also tackle a big theme related to African people. Um, Selma, I think, is an underappreciated film in African American cinema. 
I think, I mean, even though it did relatively well at the box office, um, I think it is underappreciated because <laughs> one, one thing I really enjoyed is that it showed Dr. King as a human being, as a man. Like, well, don't they all? So, we're gonna, I mean, this is a way so we can talk about things, right? So, one of the things that that movie talked about was Dr. King's philanthropy. Right? I've never seen that in like a major film or anything like that. I gloss over that. Hmm? I gloss over it. gloss over it. No, that's not to denigrate Dr. King or blemish his memory. No, he's human. He's human. I think that was important, and she's a woman who was looking at the civil rights movement through a woman's lens. We don't get that. So are you anticipating her prominence because she has female gender descent in the parents? I'm not just that. I was looking at it just in terms of the African chart, but I think, yeah, I think that is one other reason, another reason to expect that she's going to become fairly significant in I'll help you all go back. Oh. No, did it go out? No, it did it, it did that. Okay. <laughs> Let me see. We'll try to bring it back. Here we go. Okay. Um I think she also is gonna be prominent for the reasons that you mentioned, but I think in terms of how she lights up that first African's chart. I think she has a lot of attunement to it. And by virtue of that, I think she she's only gonna she's only beginning to tap into that. I think Riot is gonna be in a in a different kind of category. And I think Black Panther had that, but I actually feel that there's a lot more that Ava can tap into. And I think that's true. I mean, she's already talked about for the Netflix special incarceration of based on the work of Michelle Alexander. So what that's talking about, so the 14th Amendment doesn't completely abolish enslavement. I don't know if you know that, but what it also allows is some measure of um, having people, like the people who are in prison, to be able to work under enslaved conditions. So that's one of the things she tackled in the Netflix special. Um, but she also can be a little more lighthearted. So she did, I haven't seen it, but she did a wrinkle in time. Um, in terms of fantasy. So I think there's a little more, she's, she, and she cast it with black actors, right? Mm -hmm. You know, not all black actors, but, you know, there's a point too. So I think there's something about Ava, I saw the movie, but there's something about Ava, <laughs> um, that I think she actually has a certain resonance that can bespeak some is, that, is that her? That's her birthday, August 24th. It is August 24th again. August. You know, it's funny. I was thinking because it's you know now we it's me too. Era, and I really do believe that what moving forward we're going to have more female. And it just adds people that collect me that could be a more of a voice towards that. That could be her connection. Yep. So summary. Pluto and Sirius seem to signify achieving heights and depth, especially at particular degrees. Venus is one of our key lessons for how Americans learn to create kinship and connection beyond consumption. We perhaps have historically cared less about to whom and what we're connected as much as what we can consume. And that's a big issue in terms of how to talk about the American moment. Um, we're such a consumer-driven society that we don't talk about or think about how much that consumerism costs us or the life and the quality of life it costs us to eat. And what brings that home is just thinking about like some British person, some person in Antwerp, wherever during enslavement, who was able to kind of stir sugar into their tea. Not thinking about how many died for the sugar, to create the sugar. How much land was destroyed? And when I say land, I don't mean like, oh, they just like leveled like the whole like field. Acres, thousands of acres. So for instance, um, there were whole parts of the Bahamas 
that were particularly unrecognizable after you know, the establishment of sugarcane. It changed the whole ecology of the curriculum. Uranus stands as an awakener toward greater human and humane consciousness. Neptune is a part of the story related, I know I didn't talk about Neptune much, but when it did appear as significant, it related to the part of the story related to the American dream, but not just a home and a picket fence. The American dream, I believe, is what we're kind of arguing toward, and I'm going to talk a little more about that. So I want to look at these great cycles as I go toward my clothes. I want to look at a little bit toward these great cycles toward understanding how we might get to this destiny moment. And I think there's a couple of big cycles. I mean, of course, you can look at Jupiter Saturn, but Uranus Pluto. And I'm talking about the conjunctions here. So those of you who were born in mid to late 60s, right? Because we won't have a Uranus Pluto conjunction until the early 22nd century. And so I'm going to read my hand and I just don't care about this. I'm that generation as well. During that time, there was a staggering number of changes in food consumption, production of nearly everything, work practices, uh, especially for previously marginalized groups like women, students, ethnic minorities, and LGBTQ communities. What happens to the little guy? You will either side more with the powers that be because you are, see the practicality of it and the power that comes with it, or you'll feel obligated to tussle with those powers, because that's what was happening during that era. And that, so the, just the record to be clear, these are more the generation Xers, who somehow people sometimes forget. I'm not kidding, I think there was something listed really on the website where they had baby boomers, millennial, uh, no, baby boomers, um, then millennials, um, and I think that was it, like, it was like, where's Generation X? You know, like, it was kind of funny because one of the key songs for Generation X was from The Breakfast Club, don't you forget about the other yeah, thing? We were forgotten. Um, but I think that's kind of one thing that we contend with is dealing with the idea of the little guy. There's a strong fascination and appreciation for merging what's technological with what's organic, natural, and authentic. Because one of the things I like to say, and I am proud of my generation, is that, you know, um, we might say the baby boomers or even those prior. Um, help to introduce the world more to organic products, but we made whole foods, right? We made it much more commercially available in terms of um, Previous generations may have established the internet, but we helped develop more of the World Wide Web, in that sense. But let's talk about the future. The year is Neptune. So these are the people born in the first half of the 90s. They're different. <laughs> I thought it sounded like shade. <laughs> they are different. Let me talk about how they're different. They have a different vision and experience the world than our predecessors. For starters, there's always been a World Wide Web, even, if it, even if it, in its infancy while growing up. They can experience more of a spontaneous or quick fulfillment of their desires and dreams than their forebears. And I know that sounds metaphysical. I don't completely mean it that way. It's kind of more so like, hold on, Amazon. So it's kind of like, well, we didn't have that. You know, so, I mean, that's a whole different sensibility. Um, likely have a greater appreciation for how apparently disparate pieces fit together into a whole than others can see. These divergent slices might be ideologies, cultural narratives, or modes of building and working. So one of the things that's interesting is that, and this is the next point I'm making, that they often can be more non-hierarchical. So even though it seems, I don't think this is completely true, BLM, Black Lives Matter, is gone underground. One thing to note about it that was frustrating to people is that every other week people would say, like, this person is the head of BLM, right? Or this person over here. There, there really was no set head of BLM. There were women who founded BLM, right? But in terms of BLM, just to be clear, is Black Lives Matter. But in terms of its lack of an organizational focus, I think that was purposeful. And I think that's going to be a trademark of this generation. And if you think about it, even systematically and deeply, I think it also relates to the technology. 
I mean, the idea of the web ideally should be not hierarchical. I think some measure of that thinking is correlated to the Uranus Neptune. Um, you're like, well, what's this got to do with black people? Well, I just told you, black BLM, right? As one example of that, this is something that also may proliferate as we move forward. Might be hard for others to grasp, um, so you'll have to, you know, they'll have to mature and keep feeling uh, these thoughts through the years until they're more able to demonstrate them. Because what may be difficult for people born with the Uranus Neptune versus the Uranus and Pluto is that they're dealing with more a certain level of deprogramming. And we see this in how there's a certain fluidity even in terms of you know, gender dynamics. You know, we'll go in terms of like, well, he's non binary. Now, I'm a pretty progressive guy, or I think I'm progressive, but that, that was kind of like, what? What do you mean? Or when people, the whole pronoun thing, I will tell you honestly, that was like a moment where I was like, call you them? Yeah. Or Zay? Yeah. Right? But I think that comes also with this generation in terms of a certain fluidity. Now, for us, that's just like weird. But I think that may be a different normative that's going to push things in a different edge. Now, one of the ways in which that may happen, now, I'm going to say this. This is Uranus and Taurus, May 2018 to April 2026. 20, that first line redrawn global divisions, perhaps full ignition of, cold, of the Cold War. So I wrote that 15 years ago. Because I, I saw with Uranus and Taurus, this is what we may be coming back for, and we are, right? A clear uh, global concern about shrinking finances and resources, a fight to preserve the global sense of connection that we've achieved in terms of what we have during Uranus, I don't want to say Aries, but as much as maybe Uranus and Pisces, um, and Uranus and Aquarius definitely when the World Wide, Wide Web was growing and flourishing. So we had achieved this, and now that we go toward the square from that Aquarius, we're kind of stuck with like, are we going to maintain a sense of global sense? Um, new markets. But we must be mindful of new ways to exploit people for their labor. Because what's going to happen, what happens with you know, Taurus gets activated, just like we saw that Pluto and Moon conjunction in the first African chart, wherever you have new markets, someone gets invented, and I mean that sarcastically, to think about ways in which you kind of extract more from people for less. Okay. Now, yeah. I'm curious. There's ways you just fit it into like bringing in lower price labor from across the board. Absolutely. That's exactly what we're talking about. Human trafficking. And, and human trafficking. <laughs> so, what do I, and then I'll get to the key point. Um, I'm going to talk about US Pluto return, but I'll just say, getting ahead of myself, why is that important for African people? Because we should be on the front line in actually challenging. We are proof of that erroneous concept. Now, one thing to know, one book I would recommend everyone read, you know, especially since we just had Dr. King's birthday last month, this Black History Month, people love the 1963 speech. But that isn't the Dr. King who died. In 1968, he had just finished and it was posthumously published. Where do we go from here, chaos of community? In that book, he talked about some of the ideas that people like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez is talking about in terms of guaranteed income, for example. So when we're talking about people being exploited for their labor in order to have consumer goods, this is where I think in terms of the destiny for African Americans, it's just not about civil rights. It's about human rights, which also um, Malcolm X was about to present to the UN just before he died. Should I say before he was killed? No, I would say. I'll say he before he died. Right? You get the idea. The US Pluto return, this is going into a deeper, darker point of it, but as we go toward the end, all the US, the exact US Pluto return is a few years away. We've been in the wake of it for a while. Mm -hmm. Fundamental questions for the US Pluto return, dealing with the first questions that we had when we had the Declaration of Independence, fundamental questions would be how this country deals with power, who has it, for what purpose, 
and to whose benefit? You will notice that circulating more and more because that's what we're coming with for the political term. In this country, this will, will likely be tied to our police and our system of government. The police, and I am not talking about individual officers, so I'm not going for, you know, I'm not pointing the finger at anyone who's an officer here. I'm not saying you're a bad person. But what I will say is that the police are operating at a whole different level of power <laughs> than I think to which, this is my opinion, to which they're entitled. Yes. And becoming more and more divorced from the people they serve. Now you're like, well, that's just your opinion. You can say it, and you're black. And I'm like, well, let me also point out some other things. You say that in France, too. Yeah. And they probably yeah. say, they should be saying it all over the world. Yeah. So they would give you some like tangible ways in which you're dealing with this. And I know this is true, especially down here because I saw when I was here before. You have county sheriffs, don't you, right? You elect your sheriffs, don't you? How come you don't elect your chief of police? How come, and your chief of police likely will never have to answer to you. Your chief of police answers usually, maybe at best, to the mayor, if the mayor appoints him or her. And then that, that the police can operate independent of even some aspects of government, including the justice system. When I say operate independently, meaning that sometimes some prosecutors are even scared of the police and the fraternal orders of police. So the question is where we need to figure out how do they have their power? Why do they have a power that's not directly connected to the people that they serve? Now, with Jeff Sessions, just before he left, yeah. he took away the right for the police police brutality to go and file mm -hmm. a federal investigation into that. Is that tied yes. to this? Yeah, and then also, you know, when people have like Citizens for Gays or uh, Citizens Review or Complaint Review, there's no power in that. And you know, people thought, and I, you know, I'm active on Twitter. If you want to follow me on Twitter, I can give you my handle and, um, and talk about it. But I've been talking about this for about 10 years on Twitter. And one of the things that people would say, like, oh, when we put cameras on the police, they're going to be better, and now be some way to, to you know, bring it in. Like, no, that's not going to happen. I remember saying that literally four years ago. It, it doesn't matter. So sure enough, they have cameras and. Do you think they're brought more to justice or to trial or whatever? They didn't wear them. <laughs> or they may not even wear them. So when I say this, this is not to say that I'm anti-police or anti-establishment completely. It is more so this Pluto return is going to begin with the issue. Now you might ask, well, why? Well, one thing I'll say, and I'll finish this particular thought and move on and go to the close of the presentation. The reason why is that one of the turning points for the American Revolution wasn't just that we had been told and talked about the taxation without representation. That was one part of it. The other part of it was that American citizens would sometimes have to house soldiers and have soldiers into their homes without any explanation or any other particular part of the process. It's like, when I say house them, like these men have nowhere to sleep tonight. They go sleep with you. You're talking about the British soldiers. British yeah, soldiers, and any out of food. <laughs> any, any, any of your food, or even you know, take your, your cattle or whatever. Or horses. Or horses. Or horses. Or horses. Or horses. horses. Or horses. Yes, somewhere to buy the bottom or something. Right. Why is that important? Why is that the precedent related to that? Because you're dealing with an actually standing army in your municipal presence. Fully militarized by your on our military. Yeah. And fully sanctioned. The service, not military. Correct. The 1099. Or whatever it's called. That particular yeah, program. right. Yeah. So I just wanted to point out this is only going to increase. So, one last thing I'll say about that. About, I guess for 2012, for that election, you know, conservatives, when I would talk about the police, would always kind of pop up on my timeline, blah, blah, blah. And say, especially when we were talking about Black Lives Matter, and would say, like, well, you're just being racist against okay, blah, blah, blah. I was like, oh, sure, I got you. Find me 
one white person in recent history who's just been gunned down by the police without any armor. Just finding one. So that was 2012. And they often would like to blow off and talk, and then they would have to shut up because they wouldn't be able to find me. But I made a prediction in the truth then that I'm also now saying is true. I said, that won't last for long. You can find many white people now who have been gunned down by the police and unarmed. This had a lot of unarmed. You'll find more of that, yeah. Just one little uh, pointing out how right you are. Uh, just yesterday, the Supreme Court in a rare unanimous yeah. vote yeah. voted against the police and this confiscatory policy they created to enrich themselves by seizing the goods without yeah. less forfeiture. Forfeiture, thank you. Mike. And it started uh, was a man who got busted for heroin, and the fine was only you know a few hundred bucks, and they took his forty-two thousand dollar Land Rover that he had bought with his inheritance. And that had nothing to do with drug the drugs. Drug. So I mean, I so think the Supreme Supreme Court locked that. Yes, they voted nine zero. Nine zero. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
and then that's the directed chart because I know we're around the time and I that's a way I'll talk about on Saturday that you can kind of look at the solar arc directions. But I do want to come to some conclusions. So our creative destiny ties in the outer planets, particularly Pluto, with strong Venus, Moon, and Mercury dimensions that we talked about. Mars, because I know I did not talk about that as much, seems to relate more to the dimensions of violence in the African experience. Um, the more net result in our apparent focus. Seems like sometimes our focus shifts between Pluto, Venus, Moon, and Mercury. Suggest that if we were to revisit the American dream, as I mentioned earlier, it would be more about how we create a patchwork country of motley peoples whose glue is not financial or physical oppression. More inner knowing than our label. Which goes beyond just like white, black, you're oh, you're you're Latino, speak English. Well, all these different dimensions where we don't appreciate the other. I believe we black Americans at our best have been and can be the vanguards for this. But at our worst, we can become both the consumed, exploited vehicles for goods and services for production, and consumers. That's the hazard that we risk as black people in this country. That's fascinating because it's at these points of understanding in a completely different way that King and Malcolm X, for example, died. So both men died in 39. Um, one sixty-five, the other one sixty-eight, and both at the end of their lives talked about how the terms, especially for African Americans, this King wasn't just talking about what well, we want integration, right? What he was also talking about is that we want integration in terms of the financial distrib distribution and understanding within this country. So, and that's threatening for me. <laughs> Threatening enough that I think some people are like, yeah, no, no, you can have it. <laughs> um, and I think that is kind of critical because when we're talking about production, we can't get away from the experience of what happened to black people just thinking that it's just endemic to blackness. It's endemic to how we experience ourselves as Americans. Let me ask you a question. As a person coming in here as a practitioner of Obia, and what I see a lot of our people now the spiritual birth like by like Eva, Udon, Paolo, you know, all these different ATR. I, I see, like, with all this Mars Plutonian thing, the spiritual warfare that's also going to be fought on I, that level, tying in with the, with the energies of Earth. Like, the, I don't know if you know about the Ajogon spirits, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Of working in conjunction with those spirits to bring about retribution. You know, I think I think our focus should be definitely connecting to the earth. I think one consistent strong theme is the earth focus in the chart. You know, Sun and Virgo, Moon and Pluto, and, and Taurus. In terms of retribution, I think I I'm more concerned about redistribution, not because it's not deserved, right? I think it's distracting because. As much as this land and around the world, we're talking about greater and greater levels of production, you know, mass production of things and goods and services, we're not acknowledging the cost for that. And I think the best the best retribution is to stop it. Right. See, we're we're coming into the twenty-four thousand year sun cycle of the divine feminine. When we um, came out of that moon cycle, I guess under the Sumerians. When we had Tiamat and the male gods marching for the war. And now that we're in the sun cycle of the divine feminine, it's more of a the, the mothers, the primordial mothers, once again, the matriarch coming back in. But before that comes back around, we have this tail end of this Kalahuba cycle, this extreme negativity, you know, this plutonium energy. So, I mean, I agree. No. So it's a question of how do we fight it, or is that, you know, spiritually? No. Oh, we already know how that's going to be fought so you spiritually, think, but, but it, it ties into all of it. Oh, of course it does. Yeah. Right. I mean, the other thing that's fascinating to me, whether you want to look at, you know, the August 25th chart for us, or the August 30th chart, is that you mentioned about the, the mother. Well, we had a major star actually move forward from Leo into Virgo just a few years ago, maybe four or five years ago, and that's regulus. So 
that's also tied into the idea of feminine. Mm -hmm. But the feminine will have to be very clear on how it's like controlled to the to the to the aspects of production and power. Because the feminine is more of a socialist environment. It is definitely not imperialistic, capitalistic, and all these other things of exploiting. It's more or less wanting everybody health care, um, affordable housing, education. But we're going to have to change basic human values. Oh, oh yeah. We're going to have to change basic human values. And also, you know, one of the things, even though we didn't get into Mars, is dealing with, you know, being prepared for the violence, but without escalating the violence. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Because you did the last chart we did um, was August 30th, 2019. We saw that the last um, chart. <laughs> um, but it, and, and I don't know if you're familiar with uh, Yeah, that's it. The first African. And that was for the first African chart. And it, <laughs> um, because I'm not very, you know, fluent in. Do you see, and I don't know if you know much about tarot, but do you see a tower moment or a sun moment? Yes. Like, you know, oh, you see a tower, <laughs> you see a tower moment. Okay. Well, okay. What's the difference? What's the difference? So, well, so the tower moment is where there's a reckoning. And the sun is kind of like the glory of it. But the sun, I mean, the tower moment is, you know, it was a big moment. Even though I, it, sometimes it was symbolic, sometimes it wasn't. The American Revolution was significant in the sense that um, there was a breaking away from, you know, the idea of royalty. That had been happening for some time, meaning we don't really understand fully as Americans how central royalty was in the mindset of people. I once was an actor, and one of the things I was aware of, we did a play King Lear, and Americans were supposed to, like, the play, Wait, when the king came in, he sucked at it. Right? <laughs> he sucked at it. We did not wait because we don't have the context of living in fear of having one person deciding whether you live or die, or everything that you love and revere goes to someone else or it's just gone or banishes you from the land. We don't have that. We, we can't fully understand the full conception of it. That moment kind of was a break away from that. We are going perhaps toward a similar moment like that. <laughs> <laughs> no, what, well, do, what do we want that would be equal to the king? Our system of government, the idea of the police and the power that they have. You know, because, you know, one thing I'll give you just a sense of the police, and I, I do a lot of studies of ancient history, especially like I'm fascinated by Rome, you know, in, in other cultures. One thing is that it wasn't so much about having a standing military in your direct presence, right? You didn't have a standing military. You had them usually on the outside of the city. But one thing I'm keenly aware of, especially, you know, growing up in the hood, right? Is that I'm like, these people have like fortifications and they're almost like operating like an occupying power in your area. When I talk about, I'm talking about the police. And I, that, I shouldn't have the feeling of that in my country, right? Okay. It's like, where does that come from? And I think that that's only going to grow. And just as uh, Wade said, it's what's what's really powerful about that is happening around the world. Yeah, Spain. It's yeah. not just the United States. Spain, mm -hmm. France, Belgium. Police. The police. Yeah. I, that's why I say. I mean, I was talking to. I said, um, I was talking to Ted back there, and it was saying, you know, that one of the things that's fascinating, you know, the police have had a culture for a long time, but I think at this point, the gangs have a civilization. You know, it's like the police can, like, you know, share in terms not just of information, but resources even around the world. You know, doing trainings, um, yeah, doing joint it. investigations. Surveillance and surveillance yeah. everywhere, yeah. yeah I mean, we, we I mean, I'm not just saying the police state, but comparable to what you're talking about, I don't think we question that power. Like when I ask people, like, why don't you elect your, you know, your chief of police? You, you elect the sheriff, and the reason why that is is that the sheriff, as a certain system related to the county seat, became different than the development of municipalities, cities, and that developed a whole different 
system of police. Um, we, we used to have appointed sheriffs in Georgia, but it became so blatantly um, obviously corrupt. There's a lot of corruption that was happening sure. that they changed the law to be, to make them elected. But most places, most counties have elected sheriffs, and they're also useless, right? In human rights, to some degree. But that's because we've given so much power to the municipal police forces. And, and the sheriffs are more connected with the county. Um, I'm over time. When, when is the U.S. I believe, okay, it's 2022. Yeah. yeah. I think we're about four degrees away from the actual. Okay, another question. Last question. Okay. Okay. So the system says we're looking for a fatality moment. It's going to come up. <laughs> no. Well, I don't know if that has to be a power moment in August. I think we're going for a power moment. I didn't know you meant August. I think, like, because, you know, we're trying to get a power moment. At, you know, well, I think there is going to be another challenging moment for for us in in August, according to that Southern term. I do believe that. I don't know if it's another Michael Brown. This will be a Challenging moment for African Americans in, in August. Challenging. Challenging. But but after that, will we see the light? Like, can you see that? The light is coming. But it's coming. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, so thank you. And you want to contact me? I am doing a workshop on Saturday from 12 to 6. It is a predictive boot camp. And what that is, is because I did, was it just last year? Yeah, it was last year that I did Solar Return and um, Perfection. Um, so I'm going to be talking about Solar Returns, Perfections. Daria, some other techniques and progressions. Right. So, Two types of progressions, secondary and progressions. And, and, well, and, and also uh, tertiary and minor. And, and so are, 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 you, are, you, are, you, are you Are you available for readings tomorrow? I am also available for readings if you want to sign up for it. Yeah, yeah, we're gonna read Thank you very much. Okay. Okay. All right. How's my nieces? Save the battery once the dog. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs>